I'm not going to talk about Slim. Has anyone heard of Slim? I noticed that not many people said they were using it, but lots of you have heard of it. Excellent. That's good news. So Slim is a micro framework. So we're not talking about a nice big thing like Symfony or Slim Framework, which is what I'm also well known for. Slim, and similarly Silex is similar, um, is the C in MVC. It's only a controller. In fact, it's not even as much as that, really. It is a dispatcher. A micro framework, done correctly, takes a URI and turns it into an action. And that's all it does. These are my kind of frameworks at the moment. They are very, very small. Slim in particular is really small. Slim 2's line, uh, line, lines of code measurement, whatever it is, it was about 800 lines of code. You can read it in an afternoon. You can understand the code in an afternoon. Have you tried reading Zen Framework source code? What are the chances of reading all that code in an afternoon is? Not going to happen. Same with Symfony. Um, HTTP kernel, just the request, object, request and response objects from Symfony, is five times larger than the entire Slim framework. It's a very, very small framework, which means A, it's quite quick, because there's not a lot of code to it, and B, it's understandable. I like both of those things. Micro frameworks only work and have only started working well because we've changed the ecosystem in PHP. So we've talked a little bit already about how we're no longer in the PHP 4 world. One of the things that we've had got recently is Composer. I know some of you don't like Composer so much, and some people do like Composer, but one thing Composer has done is introduce a concept that we package our source code up independently nowadays. You can get packages on Composer to do single-use things. Much, much easier to reuse code now than it's ever been in the PHP world. So a lot of the reasons behind Sim Framework, Cake, um, Symfony 1, etc., right at the beginning, was that it was really hard to get code from somewhere else into your project. It was a relatively difficult thing to do. Um, when we did Zen Framework 1, we thought Pear was a reasonable channel to be using for installation. Who uses Pear nowadays? Who's ever used Pear? You know, it, it's no longer there. We all use Composer now. Composer is a, a big C change for PHP, and it's le enabled um, micro frameworks to come to the fore. So we can have just a controller bit, just a dispatcher, and we can pull in the rest of the code that we need from um, Composer and Packagist. And that works because of PSR0, the auto-loading ability. So Slim was invented by a guy called Josh Lockhart. Has anyone heard of Josh Lockhart? Has anyone heard of phptherightway.com? If you haven't, go and read that website. So I could stop my talk now, because if you go and read phptherightway.com, I would have taught you more than you'll hear for the next 10 minutes. It's a really, really good resource for how to do PHP nowadays. Key feature about Slim 3 over Slim 2 is PSR 7. So Slim 3 has request and response objects. Slim 2 had request and response objects. Slim 3's are PSR 7 compliant, which means that if you have middleware from any other system, they will work with Slim 3. At least that's the theory. At the moment, there is no one else with a, a compatible implementation of PSR 7, as far as I'm aware. Um, so we'll have to see how it actually works in practice. But there's a good chance that Slim 3 will be the first released version. It's based on middleware. So um, in Zen Framework 1, the way that we did our dispatching was in a loop. So we took our request in, we looked at what it was, and then we ran a loop to run the action. And we had methods called pre-dispatch and post-dispatch in our controllers to run code before and after our action was run. Zen Framework 2, we changed that to an event-based model. So in Zen Framework 2, if you want to run some code before the action is run, you create an event listener and you hook it onto the dispatch event. And if you want to run code after the action is run, you create another listener, you hook it onto another event, 
and you can do the same thing, but it's relatively complicated, it's extremely flexible, and it's very enterprise. Middleware is much, much simpler, much, much easier to understand, and that's what Slim uses, and we'll talk about that. Finally, Slim 3 comes with the DIC. Is everyone using dependency injection? Is everyone aware of dependency injection? Okay, cool. Slim uses Pimple, which was written by Fabian, and it's, again, a really, really small dependency injection container. It's something like 100 to 200 lines of code long, you can read it in half an hour and understand what it does. So I quite like it, it's a nice simple one, but again it is easy to use. First beta should occur in the next couple of weeks or so, with any luck. We all like Composer, so this installation looks very similar to the way PPI does it. Um, I've put the entire output from Composer here, because that way you can see all the dependencies of Slim 3. We use Fastroot from Nikita Popoff, we use Pimple, the DIC, and we use PSR's HTTP message interfaces. That's it. Very, very small dependency list. That's your entire app. Well, it's not quite your entire app, but that's your bootstrap, your front controller, auto load via Composer, like everyone does nowadays. Stand state, an add object, call app run. Everyone calls it app run, don't they? And use the PHP built-in server if you want to run it. Does anyone use PHP built-in server in development? Or is it just me? Just me? Just a few of us? Have we all heard of the PHP built-in server? Okay, you just prefer to run up your whole lamp stack. That's fine, not judging. And you get that. Yay, we have a working app that does absolutely nothing. Good place to start. So the core of Slim is its routing system. That's the whole point of the app, the whole point of the framework. It takes a URL and turns it into an action. And that looks something like this. Well, it looks something like this bit here. Dollar app, get, slash, and then some sort of closure. Go me for juice of colors that don't work in this light. That there is a method. It is the HTTP method. So get, post, patch, options, put, delete, etc. So if you want to respond to a particular method, this particular route will only respond if it is a get request from the client. If I wanted to respond to a post request, I would have done dollar app post. I wanted to respond to both a POST and a GET request, I would have done dollar app MAP and then passed an array in of GET and POST. Okay, so that's my method. The next string is called the pattern. It is very, very simple. It's a forward slash because we're trying to root the home page. It could be slash foo, and then it, that would be my root. And then finally, we have the action. In this particular case, it is a closure. The closure takes two variables, the request and the response object, and it has to return a response. If you were paying attention, you'd be telling me that that doesn't exist. You can't do response-write on a PSR7 object. We talked about this. Well, Gary talked about this a little bit earlier. And Gary told us, that the response object to get a body is a stream. This line here, that write method, more importantly, is not PSR7 compliant. No, I know, scary. It's actually, that's actually a method on the slim request of a response object that isn't in PSR7. Because it's a convenience method, because it turns out that you tend to want to write strings quite a lot to responses. Who would have thunk it? And you get hello world, go us. Not particularly difficult. Let's look a little bit more at that string, that uh, path or the pattern. Slash hello slash brace name has introduced a dynamic root. So now name has become an argument that is available to me within my action. It's quite simple. You use braces 
and you've suddenly got a named parameter. This is all straight from FastRoot, it's not slim directly. And we get a third parameter here, dollar args on the end of our action, and we can do args of name. We can also get it from the request object, it's known as an attribute, so you can do request dash greater than get attribute of name and you'll get the same value. And again, we just respond the response and yeah, it works. That path is simply regular expressions. You see how I said simply there? Do we all feel that regular expressions are simple nowadays? Cool. I like regular expressions. I don't find them that difficult. Um, they're worth learning. Um, fairly common one there, slash user slash ID, then I do a colon and start my regular expression, slash D plus, I want an integer, user ID 3, user ID 42, that's quite easy. Hello slash name, colon, slash W plus, I want my name to be a word character, so I can use the word Rob. That one's quite fun. Hello, A colon slash naught comma 1, followed by name of a W plus. That makes the name optional. And it also makes the forward slash between hello and the name optional. One of the slight um, oddities of fast root is that you have to name all your dynamic parameters even if you don't want to use it. So A there is simply a placeholder. So you can do quite powerful stuff with this path. You can map match fairly complex um, routes without too much effort, as long as you can remember your regular expressions. And you can give them names. So I can, there's my root, and then I can call set name, and I've given it a name. Hi. Not the most imaginative names, I like them to be clear. Because I've given it an, a name, I can use a method called URL4 that exists in the router in order to build the URL for that particular route. So this link here will be slash hello slash Rob. If I go and change this definition up here, this link will automatically change for me. So I don't have to hard code the fact I'm using slash hello all through my app. I've only coded it once in the response in the path, sorry, of my um, route. Does that make sense? Fairly clear? Cool. The other thing that Slim does is middleware. So what does that look like? There's a massive, great big long quote from Matthew. Middleware is code that exists between the request and the response. It takes the incoming request, it does some stuff on it, and then it either returns a response or passes on to the next middleware in the chain. So we'll talk about a queue, or he calls it a queue, I call it a chain. Looks something like that. So we have our request from the browser, we have some middleware, the session middleware takes the request, does something to it, maybe it adds a cookie for instance, or maybe it calls session start. Then it passes it onto the next middleware, which is the authentication middleware. This decides whether you're logged in or not maybe. And then we go through it to our app, our app does the routing, it does some work. We know that the app returns a response, because I said that earlier. So given that you have a response, the response comes back into the auth middleware. The auth middleware passes it back to the session. The session passes it back to the browser. It's a very, very simple system. It is a simply a chain. Each block that you put into the chain, you can operate on the data, the request object, before it goes down the chain, and you can operate on the response that comes back before it goes back out to the browser. So you can do actions before and after. Very, very simple. And here's an example that does both. As with everything, it looks like a closure, but you don't have to use closures. The function signature for our middleware is request, response, and next. Next is a callable. It is the next middleware in the chain. If you're the last middleware in the chain, then next is the application itself. So before we actually do anything, we're going to 
store the current time. Now we're going to call the next middleware. We pass through request and response, and we'll get back a response. Middleware always returns a response. So this is why PLSR 7 is so interesting, so important. Everything is in terms of request and response. Now we can work out how long that took. I can take the micro time, subtract the start time that I took earlier before I did anything. I've now got the time taken. I can modify that response and add an HTML string at the bottom, an HTML comment telling me how long that method took, that action took. And then, because it's middleware, I return the response. Yay, we've just written middleware. It's not very difficult. The only thing you have to remember is you must call that line if you want the rest of your app to work. If you forget that line, then nothing works. On the flip side, if you're writing a cache in middleware, you might drop this line and return a response that you had already cached. You don't have to go down the rest of the chain. You can terminate early and just send back to the browser. So it includes some middleware that does that for you related to e-tags and cache control. Not all middleware wants to be run for every single request. Sometimes you might want middleware to only run for particular routes. So we have the concept of root middleware, which works exactly the same way, but only operates if the router has matched the path first. So again, get method, path, and there's my action that does something. Traditional dot, dot, dots. Pretend there's lots of really good code in there. And then we add some middleware. Request, response, next as our three parameters. Do some stuff. Here's an example. We sanitize root parameters before we send them on. So we need to validate that the name parameter here is something that we're happy with. In this particular case, we decide to strip the tags from it. We can do that. We modify the request by getting a new request because we're using with attribute. So that's going to clone the request object, put this into the request object, which will replace the one that's currently in there. And then we return the results of whatever happens further down the chain. So dollar next in this case is almost certainly the application itself, which is this function here. So in Slim, Everything that you write that's related to the um, dispatching and the controller is a function that takes a request and a response. It either takes a next as its uh, parameter of its middleware, or it takes a dollar args if it is the root callable. They are the only rules you need to remember. Return a response. Don't screw your request up. That's the kind of places that you're going to use your middleware. Application level, you're going to have authentication, you're going to have navigation, session stuff like that, caching stuff. Root level, I tend to have access control down there, and I tend to have validation down at that level. You mix and match this stuff, depending on how your app is working. Right, so that's the core. I suppose I should check what the time is. It's very difficult to write an application without some sort of view layer nowadays. Um, I quite like PHP as a templating language, but Twig is becoming more and more common. So I thought we'd look at how Twig is integrated into um, a slim application. And obviously we use Composer, Composer Acquire, Twig has got something called Slim Twig View is our integration layer. It's provided as part of the Slim project. It is not included in the Slim Framework by default. So Slim Framework is a micro framework. It includes the bare minimum to route a request and return a response. Everything else is additional that you choose to add to your application. You might not want to use Twig. Why would we include it by default? Some sort of configuration will be required. So you're going to invent some config. Config in array terms might look something like that. We've got template path. This is where we're going to store our Twig templates. And then we have some Twig configuration because Twig needs config. It doesn't do anything unless you tell it where to cache stuff, uh, turn debugging on or whatever. 
and then you create the view like this. So this is done now within your index.php. You instantiate your object, pass in your settings, add some extensions or whatever else you do with Twig, and then you call app register. Register is the third thing within Slim Framework I talked about at the beginning. It is the DIC container. So app register is registering this Twig view into the DI container itself. So now it is accessible anywhere where you have an app object. Templates look very, very similar to anything else. I assume people know Twig or Blade or Smarty or whatever, they'll work basically the same way. And then we do something like this. App view is where we pull in the view object or out of the DI container again. Then I can fetch my Twig template, pass in whatever parameters I'm using, and that's given me a string so I write it into my response and return it. So now we're building up more capability within our application. The next stage would be introducing some sort of um, persistence library. Maybe so some of you must like doctrine. Surely someone likes doctrine here. You introduce doctrine. Or maybe you prefer um, eloquent. You would introduce eloquent. Slim doesn't care what you do at your persistence layer. It is not the controller. It's your problem. Use the one you like. Hey, hello, Rob. Don't let me do front end design. And at that point, I'm going to stop. So, if you want to know more about Slim Framework, slimframework.com is the name of the URL. The docs for slib3 are living on docs-new.slimframework.com because docs.slimframework.com is the current stable version 2, which is also a good framework. It's just that slim3 is better. And obviously, it's on GitHub because everything that's on GitHub now does. OK, that will make sense. Has anyone got any questions? Go out the back first. Why do you use Slim 3 instead of Silex? I use Slim instead of Silex because I can read the code in an afternoon and work out what it does. If you are into the Symfony ecosystem, then Silex is arguably a better choice. I find it quite heavy. There's a lot of code in Silex. Um, I know the top level bit doesn't look very busy, but that's a lot of requirements. It has a lot of dependencies, Silex. Silex is fairly big in that sense. But on the flip side, Silex comes with a lot more. It comes with all the providers ready built for you. So if you want to introduce Twig, for instance, into Silex, it's already in your system. You just have to call the right registration provider thingy. And there's about 40 of them. So Silex is bordering on no longer a micro framework in my world. It's more like a micro framework plus plus. That's where I would put it in a lot of ways. So yeah, I don't know. If you like Silex, I'd recommend using it. Personally, I think it is slightly too big for my personal preferences. Um, it doesn't help that I don't use half the things that it comes built in with. Inside out. So when you add one, it adds it to the inside of the chain. Yeah, so you, you choose when to add them. Um, it's a long way back now, that slide. Uh, where did we do middleware? There. This line here, right at the very bottom that you at the back can't see, says app-add, and then the name in the middleware, the closure. You stack them up. And they're in order. So timer, then that one, then that one. But if you think about the way it works, the one at the bottom gets executed first because uh, it's gone wrong. Oh, anyway, I need to click. Because when you add them, you add there, then you add here, then you add here, then you add here. They're added in that order. 
So the one at the bottom gets executed first. And sooner or later, you write yourself a comment above your list of ads that reminds you which way around they are. <laughs> well, at least maybe that's just me. Um, I, for ages in my last project, I had session and author run the wrong way. That took a long while to work out what was going on. Anyone else? Yep. Um, I was a bit struck by how much that reminded me of JavaScript and uh, specifically the Node Express framework. It's funny you should say that. <laughs> Every other major web application language has got a good middleware and a good response request system in it already. PHP is the only one that doesn't, that, of the major ones at least. And Connect and Express is, is the same thing. Is model well the request the response and request of PSR seven are modelled a little bit around that. That's one of the inspirations. Well, they're a bit more fundamental than just JavaScript, but PHP throughout its entire history has stolen the best ideas from other languages. And it's also stolen some really bad ideas too. But let's ignore that side for a minute. Um, PHP is very polyglot in that sense. It doesn't care where a good idea is. If, if it's a good idea, we as a community will tend to embrace it. If it's a bad idea, we will tend to embrace it too. <laughs> um, yeah, let's not go down active record too far. Um, so yeah, Connect um, and Express have got a really robust middleware system. They weren't the first. Perl had it a long while before they did. Perl. Um, there's very little in the uh, software development world that hasn't been experimented with in Perl first. Um, but they've got a really weird syntax. So yes, you will see similarities. Um, if you look at the way Sinatra works in Ruby, it's got a very similar basic idea for request response middleware next system. Um, there's one for Python whose name escapes me at the moment. Yeah. There you go. WSGI. It's common. It is really common. Uh, the basic pattern is very common. In some ways, we are catching up with PSR7 in having robust request and response objects that we can then start playing with the middleware idea with. Um, Matthew Werofini has got a project called Conduit on his GitHub, which is pretty much a direct clone of Connect. And it's very similar to this, but it is different from the way Slim works, particularly the way that the roots sort of fall through. It's a bit, I don't like that bit at all. But it seems quite clever. OK, I think we want to be kicked out by now. You're desperate to go home. So, Thank you very much for listening to me. And I'm done. <laughs>